Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge after being wronged. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, neighbors didn't turn off the music and I did it my way. The second story, I caught a thief at work with my wallet trick. The third story, I explained to the stupid driver how to park correctly. On to the first story, noisy neighbors get silenced. Back in the 80s, I lived in a flat in southeast London. The flat was located in a small tower block 10 stories high, with four flats per floor, one per corner as it were. The flat overlooked a local park and afforded very nice views of the area. The neighbors were generally very amenable, but everybody tended to keep to themselves, so no one had any problems with anyone. That all changed when a new family moved into a flat down on the second floor, on the same corner of the building where we lived. We lived on the 8th. They were not the most gracious of individuals, frequently leaving rubbish bags strewn around their floor's lobby for days, rather than depositing them in communal bins, and parking their cars in other residents' allocated parking spots. In other words, the epitome of the Appalachian Chav. Complaints to the local council invariably fell on deaf ears. They soon developed a reputation for hosting loud drunken parties at the weekends which tended to go past midnight. This was pretty effing annoying for us and the other residents, but we were somewhat less affected due to the distance between our respective flats. One particular Friday evening, however, proved to be the straw that broke the camel's back. At around 10 p.m. we heard the music start up, but it now appeared that the host had recently purchased a new sound system because the bass was now intolerably loud. I can only surmise that a peculiarity of the building's design, coupled with what sounded like much larger bass speakers, appeared to magnify the effect in our bedroom to the point where it made it quite impossible to sleep. At about 11.30 p.m., I trotted downstairs and knocked on their door. It was flung open by what I could only assume to have to be the male resident, looking somewhat the worse for wear. I politely asked him if he'd mind turning the music down, as it was very loud, rattling the furniture in my flat and making it difficult to sleep. F off! Door slams. Charming, I thought. So I go back upstairs and call the non-emergency police number and explain the situation. They assured me that someone would be around in due course. Being a Friday night, I reckoned it might take an hour or two. So with much wailing and gnashing of teeth, we sat there waiting for the cops to rock up. Sure enough, about an hour later, I saw a patrol car pull up and a couple of London's finest into our building. A few months later, the music gets turned down and the police leave. No sooner had the car disappeared up the street than the music went back up to its previous level. We endure it for another half hour, no change, since once again I call the cops. This time it takes closer to two hours for them to turn up. Yep, definitely a busy Friday night. They finally arrive around 3 a.m. and once again the music is reduced to a sensible level. Unfortunately, shortly after they depart, back up goes the volume to its previous furniture shaking intensity. As you might imagine, by now I was royally peeved off. Air indoors too. Someone not normally prone to displays of anger was positively foaming at the mouth and looked like she was single-handedly going to reenact the Battle of Austerlitz in glorious Technicolor, together with full orchestral accompaniment. It was then that I had a dazzling idea, one so fiendishly cunning and yet devilishly simple, a guaranteed cast-iron 100% pure 24-karat stonker of an idea, so brilliant that I felt certain that within a few minutes, I could stop this once and for all and execute my plan in such a way as to make it impossible to trace back to me. Cue maniacal cackling, whilst twirling imaginary mustache. Grabbing my toolkit, I crept down the stairwell to the second floor, just to double check the actual flat number. Having confirmed the number, I went back up to the fourth floor. In the stairwell just next to the exit door to the fourth floor lobby was a wooden access door that concealed one of the two electrical distribution panels for the entire building. The door was only secured by dent of a simple square key fitting, and the application of a large flat blade screwdriver would pop the latch no problem. Thus, I opened the door to reveal the distro itself. Pulling the cover open, I was presented with a large panel containing 20 large 80 amp fuses, one each for the lower set of flats. Each one was neatly labeled with the flats number, and it was but a moment to locate the appropriate one. Now, by one of those happy coincidences that usually only occur in the more egregious examples of the Hollywood B-movie, I just happened to have my toolkit a dead fuse of exactly the same type and capacity. A few weeks previously, I had to replace a similar fuse in the theater where I worked and I'd absentmindedly tossed the dead fuse in my toolbox, where I'd promptly forgotten about it, until now. Now, with all my ducks in a neat row, I pulled the fuse carrier for the miscreants flat out. Instant blessed silence. In multi-occupancy buildings, it's a handy way of isolating a specific property for those rare times when a meter has to be replaced, or other work to be carried out on the supply side without resorting to pulling a hot work ticket. 
I suspect that the building's main intake room also had the incoming three-phase supply, fused with probably 400A HRCs. I rapidly swapped the live fuse for the dead one and reinserted the carrier. Securing everything back up again, I casually strolled back upstairs to enjoy a few hours in the hallowed arms of Morpheus. Addendum. Some weeks later, the troublesome family were moved out of their flat. It transpired that the local council had received so many noise complaints over the previous six months that they were obliged to rehouse them elsewhere. The second story is, steal my wallet? Enjoy getting caught literally red-handed and losing your job. I work at a supermarket, and for a while a few years back, stuff would get stolen out of people's bags in the break room. It was mostly cash, cell phone chargers, headphones, little things like that. We did have little lockers in the break room, but they're maybe 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, one foot by one foot, and too small to hold anything larger than a medium-sized purse, so if someone had a larger bag or even a large puffy jacket, it wouldn't fit. I usually carry a messenger bag big enough to fit a notebook or sketchbook in. I like to draw or write while on break, which was too big to stick in one of the lockers without having it get stuck, and I usually stashed it under a coat rack. I hardly ever kept money or anything more valuable than a mechanical pencil in my bag while at work. I keep any money or my debit card on me at all times, except for one particular day. Before work one particular Sunday, I had to go buy a new television, since mine had suddenly stopped working the night before. I must have forgotten to take my wallet out of my bag before heading to work, because the following day, I discovered it was missing. However, whoever took it only took the wallet, because my debit card, college ID, and my MBTA, Boston subway system, fare card had been thrown into my bag. The wallet in question was a small coach brand wallet, so I can see why they took it, but I had only spent about $14 on it, since I got it at a coach outlet store, so it wasn't like I spent a lot on it. As annoying as it was to have my television die in the middle of playing an online video game, thankfully on the Switch, so I could at least finish the match I was in, because I had to buy a new television, I had spent the $150 cash that I had been keeping in my wallet up until that point. After meeting with the management and our loss prevention guy, LP for short, the consensus was basically, we're sorry that happened to you, but there's nothing we can do about it. Keep your stuff locked up from now on. Which I did. I started locking my bag to the coat rack with a bike lock. The market I work at is union, so management isn't allowed to put cameras in the break room. So I talked to our LP guy about it a little more and asked him if I would get in trouble if I were to put a prank wallet filled with glitter and powdered food coloring in my bag. And he said not at all. I also went to the union steward about it, and he also said I wouldn't get in trouble, but also told me to be careful. So I put my plan into motion. I bought a fake coach wallet that cost more than the one that had been stolen, go figure, some edible glitter and powdered red food coloring. I sewed a strip of elastic into the opening of the wallet. The wallet had a zippered pocket for money and cards, then stuffed it with as much glitter and food coloring powder as I could, so that when the wallet was opened, all the glitter and food coloring would pop out all over the hands of the person who opened it. I then planted it in my bag and waited. I didn't have to wait very long. A few weeks later I heard from our LP guy that a cashier had been going through people's bags again and fell for my glitter bomb wallet hook, line, and sinker. Tried to then wash the glitter off her hands, which activated the powdered red food coloring. She then freaked out when it stained her hands bright red and went to management about it. She wanted the person who planted the wallet to get in trouble for it, but since it had been within another co-worker's personal belongings and the wallet wasn't harmful or illegal, there was nothing they could do to the worker who did it. The girl ended up getting fired for openly admitting to going through people's bags for money and other valuables, and ended up throwing two other cashiers under the bus for stealing from people as well. They were fired shortly after. I did get spoken to by management after the fact, since they knew that I had planted the wallet in my bag, but the discussion was more or less, we know the wallet was yours, we didn't tell the person who tried taking it that it was yours, and we're not going to tell you that you can't do that again. The last story is, I warned you not to park here. This all happened when I was a young man, around 21 years old. I was sharing a flat with another young bloke in a Perth suburb, Australia. I had not long had my first car, an old 1972 beat-up Ford Falcon. You know, base model, slightly rusted, air-conditioned floor, etc. I'm 50 now, so quite a long time ago. I loved my old Ford. It was roomy, comfortable, and reliable. As a part of the large block of flats we lived in, each flat was given two parking spaces, one under cover and one open. My spot, clearly numbered with a 2 in large white paint digit, was the open space. All was well for a few months. I was getting along really well with my flatmate, and we got along with our other neighbors. Enter Entitled Person He drove a fairly new BMW, nice and flash. Whilst I was at work, he took it upon himself to allow himself to steal my spot. In Australia, the Ford Falcon was one of the largest cars on the road, and parking it was difficult. It would be classified as a mid-sized in the USA. I get home and my spot is occupied, 
D. Off I go to find someone else's spot to borrow for the night. I ask Unit 1, as I know they don't have a car, and they were quite accommodating to me. Still, I go inside and write a note for the owner of the BMW, and neatly place it under his windscreen wiper, hoping that a polite request would do the trick. Nope. Next day, same thing. Now, I'm getting a little irritated. I repeated the previous night's efforts, but made the note bigger and a tad ruder. I know he got the message, because the bits of paper were gone. Day 3. Same again. It's the weekend. Unit 1 couldn't lend me their spot, as they had visitors. Okay, fair enough. I parked my big old Falcon across the front of the BMW, blocking it in. I wasn't going anywhere that weekend. Next morning, BMW was gone. Somehow it managed to slip the coupe. I steal my spot back again. That evening, the BMW did to me what I did to him, blocking me in. I see red. Upset me is not nice me. I'm patient. I bide my time. Monday morning, he's gone and I go to work. Monday evening, yep, you guessed it, spot taken again. Fair dinkum. Does this guy think he owns the spot? Revenge mode. New note on a sheet of A4 paper, written on his windscreen with big black text. The kind that goes through the page. Full sheet is stuck on his windscreen with that horrible masking tape that always leaves something behind when it's peeled off. Next day, note gone and BMW still in my spot. Okay? Same again with the note. Rude to the extreme. Kindly explaining to the BMW why in the seven dark levels of, uh, I shouldn't park in someone else's spot, maybe even referring to his dubious parentage. I then get out the big gun, my silicone gel. I used the entire tube, plastering every last square millimeter on the page, and stuck it to his windscreen, right in front of where his eyes would look through at the road. Try ignoring that. When I go to leave for work the next morning, the BMW is gone, nowhere to be seen. I saw it further down the car park a couple of days later, with a brand new windscreen. Needless to say, he never parked in my spot again. In fact, neither did anyone else, ever. Why I didn't just get him towed? Here's why. Think about it, I was young and naive at the time, I didn't even think about towage. Now, different story. Then I just wanted him to go away and leave me alone. I wasn't even aware at the time I could, so horses for courses. The time was the early 90s, I was in my early 20s, skinny and not particularly strong, and with no idea how to fight. I only had my intellect, the guy peed me off, I didn't know which unit he was in. Never saw him at any time, nor did he approach me when it was obvious which unit I was in. I started off being polite and progressed gradually downwards from there culminating in the final offense. Context? I got what I wanted. He was sorely inconvenienced and seriously embarrassed publicly for the entire large block of flats to see. Everybody would have passed him in the plastered note on his now unusable car. Plus, since nobody would help me, I had to help myself, and of course warn them all not to mess with the weakling from flat number two. Having him towed would have produced less humiliation, as he could have merely shrugged it off as a broken down car. It worked. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button.